Okay, thank you all for coming. It is such a thrill to see the center so packed. Um, I want to thank you all for coming to our final lecture of the semester as part of our series this semester that we've been holding on 100 years since 1917. My name is Joshua Tucker. I'm the director of the Jordan Center. This is the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia. And we've been so pleased this semester to have this series, which is our sort of first running lecture series of the semester, that we've had on 100 years since, uh, since 1917. And I want to give a special thanks to my colleagues in the history department who put this together, who brought this out. Um, we had Yanni speaking earlier, Jane spoke, and Anne spoke. And today, I'm not actually going to even introduce our speaker. I'm going to introduce the person who's going to introduce our speaker. But we are absolutely delighted to have our speaker, who is not being named yet, here with us today to wrap up the, the, our lecture series. So this has been uh, wonderful. It's wonderful to see all of you out here today on a Friday afternoon. And it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Anne O'Donnell, who's going to introduce our speaker today. But thank you all for coming out today. Oh, and just to let you know as well, we still have more actual talks going on this semester. Check out the Jordan Center uh, webpage. Check out the mailing list. This talk will be archived if you have friends who couldn't get in, who couldn't make it. The whole talk is video. And for everyone to know here, when you ask questions, the talk is being live streamed as well and will be archived on our website. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Anna Donald to introduce our speaker. So you've been on tender hooks. Professor Sheila <laughs> Uh, needs no introduction. She transformed the field of Russian history in, in works on revolution, in monographs, articles. A personal favorite of mine is on Nep era artisans and their fate. Um, and in synthetic studies relied upon by scholars and students of Russian history alike. Her most recent volumes treat the politics of Stalin's inner circle. And her newest books, in fact, I have flyers here, are, I believe, for sale out front, as, as I understand it? Mm -hmm. yes. No, they're not for sale, that's I think a discount coupon, basically. I see, I see. And there are books. But there are books. Oh, there are books right there around There are books the for sale. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're a full service. There, there, are books. Yeah. Yeah. there are books for sale. Um, Mishka's War, a story of survival from war torn Europe to New York, which is a story of Professor Fitzpatrick's late husband's uh, life and experience in Nazi Germany. And A Spy in the Archives, a memoir of Cold War Russia. We are utterly delighted to have Professor Fitzpatrick concluding our series on the Russian Revolution for this the centenary. And the question she will be asking, as we understand it, is was the Russian Revolution a failure? So I turn the floor over to her. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I think I'll try standing up because I, it, it's so odd if you sit down and all you see is the front row. And I hope that, uh, that my voice carries because that of course means that I can't really use, uh, use the mic anyway. If you're having difficulty hearing me, well then I suppose you'd better start waving your hands and then we can reorganize. So, was the Russian Revolution a failure? Failure has been the keynote of Anglophone Western commentaries on the centenary of the Russian Revolution. Even shameful failure, an event to mourn and not to celebrate, as the London Spectator put it. And, and the reason that, that it's to mourn and not to celebrate is because the revolution was the precursor and progenitor of Stalinism. Now this formulation uh, of failure is striking because it is new. In the Cold War, Western commentators were in general very hostile to the Russian Revolution, but they rarely described it as a failure. Rather, it was seen as an evil and threatening success that offered major global competition to democracy. In his biography of, uh, of Lenin, published in 2000, Robert Service had already ventured the prediction that, quote, perhaps in a few years hence, Lenin will be seen to have thrust his country and under Stalin's leadership a third of the world down a cul-de-sac. In 1996, Orlando Fidris entitled his popular and influential history of the revolution, A People's Tragedy. In a centenary volume focusing on the question of historical inevitability, Tony Brenton, a British ex-diplomat, reiterated the tragic characterization and turned the volume up on the cul-de-sac image, uh, suggesting that while the 1917 revolution might be seen as, quote, profoundly important in the events it gave rise to, it increasingly looked like, quote, one of history's great dead ends, like the Inca Empire. 
<laughs> what we have learned from this revolution, Brenton concluded, is, quote, what does not work. As a theory of history, the revolution tested Marxism and it failed. The dictatorship of the proletariat did not lead to the communist utopia, but to more dictatorship. <clears throat> For Brenton and many others, the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, discredited not only the Soviet version of socialism, but socialism per se. To quote Brenton again, I quote, not the least of the lessons of the Russian Revolution is that for most economic purposes, the market works much better than the state. Uh, the rush away from socialism since 1991 has been gathering. That's Brenton, not, not my phrase. <laughs> now, even historians more sympathetic to the revolution than Brenton were talking in terms of failure as a centenary approach. Uh, Steve Smith, the British social historian, wrote in a 2000 symposium in Critica, uh, that, quote, historians today are more likely to see the revolution as the initiation of a cycle of violence that led in inexorably to the horrors of Stalinism and Nazism rather than as a flawed attempt to create a better world. They are more likely uh, to see the mass mobilization as motivated by irrationalism and aggression than by outrage and injustice or a yearning to be free. Uh, such a view derives from the correct sense that the Russian Revolution was a failure and from a sense that 20th century revolutions in general tended to produce regimes worse than the ones they overthrew. Now, that quotation is notable for the fact that the less popular position Smith is outlining was essentially Smith's own position in his earlier work. <laughs> um, now, to be sure, he was a bit uneasy about this conclusion. Uh, again, quoting, we see the violence and the bloodshed easily enough in the Russian Revolution, but it is harder for us to describe the idealism, hope, and self-sacrifice that were also the revolution's key constituents. Uh, he thought uh, that in key respects, our ability to understand, certainly to empathize with the aspirations of 1917 had actually diminished. <coughs> in addition to lack of empathy, historians contemplating the centenary uh, including Smith himself in his 2017 book on the Russian Revolution, seemed to find it hard to work up any enthusiasm for its significance in today's world, or even in today's historiography. Uh, Boris Kalinitsky uh, confessed in Critica's 2015 symposium that the topic was now less interesting to him than it had been back in the, in the 1980s when he started his pioneering investigation of language, class, and revolution. Brenton suggested that in light of the Russian Revolution's generally dismal record, the Chinese Revolution was likely to be, quote, by far the world's most significant inheritance of its Russian precursor. Yet it's not so long ago that most commentators on the Russian Revolution, regardless of their value judgments about it, agreed on one thing, that the revolution was important. Uh, it was an event that did more to shape the history of this century than any other, wrote uh, Hilton Kramer in a review of Richard Pipe's History of the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, that deplored the slowness of the Western public to assimilate Pipe's message about the evil nature and disastrous impact of the revolution. But note, it's important, uh, although disastrous. On the opposite side of the political <coughs> spectrum, for the British Marxist historian Eric Hobsbawm, writing in the early 1990s, uh, the Russian Revolution was the event that shaped the 20th century and made the dichotomy between capitalism and socialism its dominant paradigm. Quote, uh, the October Revolution had far more profound and global repercussions than its ancestor, the French Revolution. For if the ideas of the French Revolution has, as is now evident, outlasted Bolshevism, the practical consequences of 1917 were far greater and more lasting than those of 1789. Continuing the quote, a mere 30 to 40 years after Lenin's arrival at the Finland station in Petrograd, one third of humanity, from the Elbe to the Adriatic, China, Korea, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Cuba, and parts of, of Africa as well as the Soviet Union, found itself living under, found themselves living under regimes directly derived from the Soviet one. <coughs> so, why does the picture now, in particular the picture of uh, the Russian Revolution's uh, significance looks so different. Well, I'll start off by discussing uh, the notion of revolutionary failure, because I was quite, I, I was quite intrigued by the use of that word, and, uh, and, and in particular, the, the lack of a do elucidation of what failure or success might mean in connection with a revolution. So does failure <coughs> mean non-achievement of revolutionary goals? If so, since all revolutions have a range of uh, generally incompatible goals, 
and consequently a range of outcomes, how do we judge exactly what the revolution's real goals are? What percentage of non-achieved goals would equal failure? For example, in concrete terms, with regard to the Russian Revolution, would failure to reach the egalitarian goal trump success in implementing the industrialization one? Or does failure mean a revolutionary outcome that, while it may or may not deliver on what the revolutionary stated to be their goals, is morally unacceptable regardless? Here, the obvious concrete example is, uh, the ter is terror, uh, acceptable to the re Bolsheviks as a revolutionary method, though presumably not as a revolutionary outcome, but unacceptable in its social Stalinist dimensions to almost all contemporary commentators. What about revolutionary success? Would it mean a legacy of ideas that continued to be discussed down the centuries? On that, of course, Hobsbawm gave preference to the French Revolution. Is it a matter of the scope and significance of the political, social, economic, cultural change affected? And if so, in what time span? In other words, at what point do we make our judgment? Is a revolution successful only if it gives birth to a nation, like the American Revolution? In that case, was the Russian Revolution a success up to 1991, at which point it became a failure? Trotsky and others have written a permanent revolution, but this, to my mind, is an oxymoron. Revolution is, by definition, a transient state, uh, although revolutionaries, of course, must believe otherwise, at least for a while. Revolutions are moments of madness, in Aristide Zolberg's phrase. Crane Brinton saw a revolution as a pathological state, a bout of illness which rises to a climax, at which point the patient either dies or recovers. Unless the state is to collapse into anarchy, someone, at some point, has to restore order and, in effect, end the revolution. Or, to put it another way, if the revolutionaries, the revolutionaries succeed in establishing a new order, they must at some point stop being revolutionaries, that is, people interested primarily in upheaval and destruction, and become rulers, that is, people interested in making things work in order to realize revolutionary goals. Revolutionaries have trouble deciding how to end the revolution, and so do historians. How simple it would be if revolution was like a university term whose beginning and end are clearly established in the statutes. But unfortunately, revolutions are not things in the world, but mental constructs. Within some constraints, historians can define their beginnings and ends as they please. That is, in the way that suits their partly a priori understanding of what a revolution is. So we have historians ending their studies of the Russian Revolution at quite different times. Um, some with the October seizure of power, some with the Reds' victory in the Civil War at the beginning of the, of the 20s, some with the death of Lenin, uh, Steve Smith in his new book with the end of NEP, uh, which is quite perplexing as a climax to the revolution, uh, un until you see that his point is to separate uh, the revolution from Stalinism. So Stalinism, new thing, is going to start in 1928. Uh, <coughs> uh, E.H. Carr, I guess, assumes, uh, unless one simply thinks he ran out of time writing his multi-volume um, uh, 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 book, uh, it, it's the, the end of the first five-year plan and the foundation of a planned economy, in quote. In my Russian Revolution, uh, after some initial he hesitation, I treated the great purge as the, as the last act of the revolution. Of course, all these judgments are subjective depending on what you think is the right story to tell, and there are many things that go into that right story. When the Soviet Union collapsed, a lot of people started to reconfigure the revolution as a 74-year-old nation-building experiment that ended in failure. Now, failure and success are obviously highly uh, subjective judgments. Often they focus on a particular stated or implied revolutionary goal deemed by the writer to be the crucial one. Now, those goals, uh, there are quite a few of them in the Russian Revolution that, uh, that, that can be chosen. Uh, international overthrow of capitalism was a goal, freedom, equality, including gender equality and, uh, and, and equality of nationalities, ethnic equality, the end of exploitation, <coughs> rule of the proletariat, or in other words, workers will become masters, and of course, general improvement in the condition of the people. Now, on some of these, like, like freedom, all revolutions are likely to fail after the first chaotic moment of liberation, 
But the Russian Revolution, with its one-party system, intolerance of, of opposition, and in the 1930s, mass repression, is generally judged to have failed particularly egregiously. That's on the freedom uh, axis. Equality of all citizens is another revolutionary objective unlikely uh, to be realized in every, any revolution. Although the Bolsheviks are generally held to have done well on emancipation of women, and according to current conventional wisdom, <coughs> better than was once thought on nationalities. As for the end of exploitation, I've been here, here again, one can expect a revolution to fail on this one. Uh, and the best verdict here uh, may be the old so Soviet uh, joke that socialism means the end of exploitation of man by man and its replacement by its opposite. <laughs> <laughs> With regard to the promise that workers shall become masters, the Bolsheviks did make a real attempt in the 1920s and early 30s to drive the bourgeoisie, what they called the bourgeoisie, out of elite positions and simultaneously to bring in workers and peasants via affirmative action and party recruitment. Now that is, of course, not what, uh, what a Marxist would understand by rule of the proletariat as a class. Uh, it is, however, prob it probably was, or at least I have so argued, uh, seen by many ordinary people as an, a, an effective substitute for that, that promise that workers will become masters. In other words, individual workers uh, did indeed rise into the new elite. Now, in centenary discussions, I, of which I have heard many, having gone to many uh, conferences on the Russian Revolution this year, and heard many, many papers, and I was struck by the fact that I heard nothing on women's emancipation, which used to be a big theme. Uh, nothing until the very last one uh, in, in Pennsylvania, when Wendy Goldman got up and did uh, a very spirited, uh, uh, not defense, presentation of that argument. But I think the reason that people have been um, have not been discussing it is because we're f we're fastened on the trope of failure, and that uh, belongs to another kind of <coughs> argument. It, it was, of course, often cited in the past as a revolutionary achievement. Now, the overwhelming emphasis at the conferences I've been to has been on the revolution's failure to bring freedom, with particular <coughs> reference uh, to Stalinist repression as a revolutionary outcome. Now, it used to be a matter of debate among historians whether one should see Stalinism as, a, as it were, a legitimate outcome of Leninism or in the revolution or otherwise, whether one should see essential continuity or not. Uh, now, that argument, it seems to have been assumed that the continuity uh, uh, line prevailed uh, and therefore that, that Stalinism should be seen as a, as a political um, uh, outcome. Even Smith's book, I mentioned it ends uh, the revolutionary period in 1927, therefore tries to make a distinction uh, between the revolution and Stalinism, but at the same time he concedes that the revolution is, can be blamed for Stalin's repression, so he, he basically concedes the point that his periodization uh, uh, implicitly questions. Now back to uh, the, uh, the, the various objectives of the revolution. Socialism was, of course, the Russian Revolution's central objective. Our uh, problem with that is that nobody ever agrees what socialism is, so very hard to say whether it's achieved. But the, meeting, the meaning, uh, if we look at the Soviet Union and the meaning that emerged in practice, uh, <coughs> in the, the practice particularly of the 1930s, are, <coughs> in other words, if we look at at what they appeared to mean by the construct by socialism in the phrase the construction of socialism, <coughs> uh, then we would conclude uh, that it was uh, uh, that this understanding of socialism was of a state-led economic and cultural modernization, recognizably socialist because the enterprises were owned by the state because of nationalization of industry and trade and the collectivized farms and the existence of a national economic development plan. So that, I, I, uh, that can be taken as a Soviet practical understanding of what the socialism was that they were trying to build, understanding as of the 1930s. Now, in the 1960s, modernization theorists in the US uh, gave the Soviets relatively high marks on that modernization objective. And the British historian E. H. Carr uh, had already uh, labeled it as, a, as a, with the crowning of the revolution. Uh, in his uh, volume, Foundation of a Planned Economy, on the early, early uh, 1930s, treating that as the, the revolutionary achievement. 
Judgments of economic success, however, are extremely vulnerable to changes in economic circumstances. I don't know if anybody remembers the unstoppable Japanese economic tiger of the late 1980s. <laughs> uh, the result of the Soviet economic development uh, approach, both as applied at home and in the third world, might look uh, in, uh, impressive or at least worth serious consideration to many economists from the 1930s to the 1960s. But then came the global information revolution in which the Soviets were felt to have missed the boat. From that time on, it became a truism uh, that bureaucratic state socialism lacked a crucial capacity that capitalism possessed, namely the abil ability to stimulate and respond to technological innovation. As a result of this shift in mindset, the smokestack industry that had been the triumphant symbol of Soviet achievement came to look quite different. More like, economic, uh, more like environmental blight than economic pro progress. This brings another twist to the success or failure argument. Was it still success if the more or less reached, more or less reached in economic developmental goal now looked not modern in a contemporary sense, but yesterday's notion of modernity? I'll go on now briefly to the Russian reaction. I can say more about that uh, later, uh, but I'll, I'll give a, a, a short version here. The Russians, as I, I'm sure everybody knows by now, decided not to celebrate the centenary, with any, not to mark it with public uh, celebration. Uh, that is, Putin's government declined to organize public national commemoration or issue an official assessment. Now, refusing to issue an official assessment, telling people how to um, think about it, could be seen, although I don't think anybody has seen it like that, it could be seen as an advance in that Russian and Soviet governments have been rather too prone to tell their citizens what to think about any important thing. Uh, uh, the, so it, 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 it could be considered uh, 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 to be a, a, a almost praiseworthy leap, leaving uh, things open up uh, to discussion and uh, responding to the fact that Russian public opinion is in fact quite divided on the revolution. Nevertheless, the Putin's, Putin's uh, d decision was unexpected in that the Russian Revolution, being Russia's main claim to fame in the global histories of the modern world, might seem too valuable an entrance in the reputational stakes for a Russian government to disclaim ownership. Sergei Lavrov, foreign minister of Russia, seemed to be thinking along these lines when uh, in uh, March 2016, he warned that hostile Western commentators would probably use the centenary to disparage Russia, as usual, and, quote, portray the 1917 revolution as a barbaric coup that dragged down all of European history. Evidently, Lavrov was expecting that uh, when come the centenary, uh, it would be celebrated as the opposite of a barbaric coup, but as something like a Russian achievement. The decision against celebration seems to have been a last minute uh, a resolution on, on Putin's part, suggesting either genuine uncertainty about his own assessment, uh, or as some have suggested, though I'm not wholly convinced of this, a strong fear of clashes on the streets if, there, if, if, uh, uh, if, if it came a matter of public uh, demonstration. In a curious compromise, the former Revolution Day, November 7th, uh, now officially moved three days earlier, um, was celebrated, what was celebrated in the end, in a, in a sort of way. November 4th, uh, where it had been, it had been moved to November 4th, but that fell on a Saturday, uh, and so the actual Praznik was on a Monday, and on the Tuesday, uh, there was a military parade on Red Square, which did not celebrate the centenary of the Russian Revolution, but rather it celebrated the marking of the uh, of, the, uh, of, of, revol of the anniversary of the revolution in 1941 in a parade outside the Kremlin when the Germans were at the gates and the soldiers who marched in that parade went immediately to the front. So in other words, not marking, not commemorating the revolution, but, com but bringing in that um, all-purpose sort of uh, bolster of Russian self-confidence, uh, the, the, the victory in the Second World War. Putin's relationship to the Russian Revolution and the Soviet state is ambiguous. He's brought up in the system, of course, and he was neither its overthrower nor its successor. Uh, he has said that there are things he values in the Soviet system. For example, the planned economy, uh, public health and, and education, and the industrialization of the 1930s, making possible victory in the war. He appears to hold Stalin in quite high regard, 
as a nation builder on the Peter the Great model, uh, although it must be said that he recently opened a monument to victims of, Stalin, of Stalinist repression. So that did int introduce uh, a, a significant uh, qualification uh, to, um, to his admiration for Stalin. Now, Putin's grand grandfather may have worked as Lenin's cook, as one finds stated from in various sources, but the grandson has always seemed to prefer Stalin, the nation builder, to uh, Lenin, the revolutionary. Now, he's expressed uneasiness about repressions of the Lenin period. It's a very curious um, response to a question he gave, I think it's in Stavropol, a couple of years ago, where he, he deplored not exactly the execution of the royal family, but why did the whole household have to go, why the dog, why the, do why the doctor, and so on. Um, that he also spoke rather more coherently about his dislike of, of Lenin's advocacy of terror against the clergy. Uh, uh, which he notes, but Lenin personally endorsed. He also, and particularly, holds against Lenin his insistence in an early 1920s argument with Stalin on the uh, federal nature of the USSR, giving republics the possibility of secession, of secession not succession. Now, this is a, a little bit of, a, of, of an inaccurate reporting of history, but it doesn't matter. The, the, the point is that from Putin's point of view, uh, Lenin in not... Uh, in not binding the republics to the Union, or not trying to bind them irrevocably to the Union, uh, did the equivalent of laying a time bomb under Russia that went off in 1991. Now, in 2015-16, Putin seems to have been considering a commemoration of the Revol Russian Revolution uh, with the central theme of reconciliation, something which the revolutionaries, revolution's admirers would certainly have find, found provocative. Uh, his Minister of Culture, Vladimir Medinsky, has expressed the opinion that revolutions are always bad and, bad and bloody, making things worse, not better, leading to injustice and moral degradation, destroying society's best people and giving opportunities to its worst. <coughs> While they were idealists, uh, Medinsky said, as well as war criminals, he used that phrase, among both red and white protagonists in the revolution and civil war, uh, the Russian Revolution in Medinsky's and possibly uh, Putin's view should be seen as a tragedy, albeit with heroic ele elements. Now, going back to the international uh, response to the centenary, uh, I had a look at what the, I, I, I thought at least surely on the international left, they will be saying the revolution mattered, and perhaps even they would say it was a good thing. But that really isn't so, <laughs> as far as the Anglophone international left is concerned. Now, it may be that we have a different line of commentary in Latin America. I think, uh, I think indeed, there is more, uh, more uh, enthusiasm there, but I, I can't report directly on that. But the Anglophone left's uh, response to the centenary has been, to my mind, remarkably muted. Uh, with a general avoidance of statements about the, the Russian Revolution's achievements uh, and focusing in, instead on the value of the Revolutionary Act itself as an encouragement to posterity, to think you don't have to put up with what you've got. Uh, Tariq Ali, uh, uh, China Mieville, Slavoj Zizek have all suggested that what needs to be celebrated or remembered about the Russian Revolution is that it demonstrated that things can be changed as a result of human will towards change. Uh, the world, world's first socialist revolution deserves ce celebration, China Mieville wrote, because, quote, things changed once and they might do so again. Now, I think that's a really minimal claim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he goes on, it, it, it's a nice book, actually, I, I, despite that it was written for, uh, by somebody uh, without, without his trade union card to write history, but nevertheless. Uh, he says, uh, He's taking uh, his image from Mandelstam here. Liberty's dim light shone briefly, even if what might have been a sunrise turned out to be a sunset. Uh, but it could have been otherwise with the Russian Revolution, he says, and if its sentences are still unfinished, it is up to us to finish them, quote. Now for Tariq Ali, British Marxist um, journalist and uh, writer, celebrating the revolution with a Lenin book, uh, apart from the fact that presumably somebody commissioned a Lenin book, uh, was, quote, a necessary act of resistance, given how hostile the current ideological climate is to anything associated with the social and liberation struggle of the last century. In other <coughs> words, uh, went write this book as a kind of protest against the fact that people think that it's not worth writing such a book. 
Zizek, <coughs> and usually for a commentator from the left, uh, acknowledges um, <coughs> an essential continuity between Lenin and Stalin, uh, writing that the tragedy of the old Bolsheviks who perished in Stalinist purges was, uh, quote, that they were not able to perceive in the Stalinist terror the ultimate offspring <coughs> of their own acts. <coughs> While the possibility exists that things might have gone somewhat better had Lenin survived in good health another 10 years, uh, Zizek, in contrast to Tariq Ali, uh, suggests that the likely outcome was, quote, nothing essentially different, the same Stalinism just without its worst excesses. Now, this is in a book called Lenin 2017, uh, which is on the face of it uh, um, an implicit statement that uh, Lenin and the revolution matters. Uh, so I, I continue to quote, let's face it, uh, today uh, Lenin and his legacy are per perceived as hopelessly dated, belonging to a defunct paradigm. Uh, Zizek goes on, not only was Lenin understandably blind to many of the problems that are now central to contemporary life, ecology, struggles for emancipated sexuality, etc., his brutal political practice is totally out of sync with current democratic sen sensitivities, <coughs> And his vision of the new society as a centralized industrial system run by the state is simply irrelevant. We have to, quote, accept that Lenin is dead, that his particular solution failed, even failed monstrously. Still quoting Zizek. Nevertheless, for Zizek, ever the con contrarian and provocateur, that doesn't mean abandoning Lenin, irrelevant though he may be, irrelevant and totally wrong in all respects, so he may be. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Lenin has left us a very valuable legacy, and he calls this Lenin at his Beckettian best. And Beckettian means is a reference to Samuel Beckett, uh, worst would hold. And his Beckettian best is uh, leaving us with the lesson, quote, try again, fail again, fail better. So that uh, is uh, what Zizek says is the useful Leninist uh, uh, lesson to us. Now, as far as professional historians of the Russian Revolution are concerned, or of the, of, of the first quarter of the, of, of the 20th century in Russia, part of the lack of excitement about the, the centenary of the Russian Revolution may be explained in terms of current sc scholarly focus and fashion. Up until the end of the 1990s, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> up until the end of the 1990s, the First World War was almost completely obscured, both in Soviet and Western historiography, by the Russian Revolution. Uh, when the Russians, when the Soviets wrote about it, the war was just part of the prelude to revolution. And in the West, it got remarkably little uh, a, a, a individual attention, uh, which meant that Russian historians were not part of the wider discussion about the First World War, which, which French, German, all other, basically, um, European historians uh, were engaged with. In the writing of Russian history, the war featured mainly as a cause, or of course not a cause, there were two ar uh, arguments both ways on this, of the revolution. In the general comparative scholarship on the First World War, uh, Russia was largely absent. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, these lacunae quickly became apparent, and a new cohort of Russian historians set out both to recover the war and to re-establish the comparative connections with Europe. Around the same time, the peeling off of non-Russian republics of the Soviet Union drew historians' attention to, uh, to, to the whole uh, importance of republics, regions, and borderlands. Uh, and so there's lots and lots of study. Uh, the, the term empire, if you remember, which had previously been used only uh, in, in, a, in, in some discourses on Russia, usually what were regarded as anti-Soviet discourses in Russia, suddenly everybody started talking about empire and everybody started looking at, um, at the borderlands and republics. Uh, and uh, the effect of that, uh, it certainly added to knowledge of the Russian Revolution in its local manifestations, but it also fragmented it, I think. Uh, in general, one might say that uh, all sorts of tendencies within the historical discipline uh, have been not to look directly at the Russian Revolution, but to look at it in some broader context, or to look at uh, look at look around it in some ways. I, uh, Mark Steinberg's admirable study, for example, I think it's called Russian Revolution, 1905 to 21. 
uh, which extended the chronological boundaries. But what he's done there is he's uh, drawing on the popular press day by day for a picture of 1917. And of course, the popular press is never going to say, now the revolution is going on. In other words, the revolution is, a, is a, um, uh, an after the fact con construction in many respects. So <coughs> taking that source is, going, is likely to show you everything that isn't necessarily uh, connected with the revolution. And indeed, so are his various chapter headings. Uh, we've got their everyday life, we've got women, we've got urban crime, popular culture, uh, borderlands. In fact, just about everything but the revolution itself, everything but the, uh, the, 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 the topics, the Moscow and uh, Petrograd focused uh, discussion, which has been the uh, staple of the literature up to now. <coughs> As the revolution centenary approached, uh, historians uh, were busy embracing a new period periodization that is 1914 to 21, uh, which sandwiched and necessarily diminished the revolution between the First World War and the Civil War. Now, I think that's, uh, in general, a very, uh, uh, it, it's a welcome, uh, uh, it, it's a welcome development and <coughs> brings a really valuable new perspective. Uh, in it, but of course it's not exactly illuminating the revolution, but rather uh, putting it in, in uh, another context and, and, and you know, do I think dimini in, uh, effectively diminishing it. Uh, <coughs> now that, that whole uh, genre of, um, of scholarship, uh, of, uh, it, it, it's Peter Holquist's continuum of crisis that's, uh, that, that, that underpins it, and uh, uh, Laura Engelstein's new book, is, uh, is uh, based on the same uh, 1914 to 21 chronology. But <coughs> while I think there, uh, there are <coughs> sort of purely professional reasons why the revolution isn't of such great interest to historians at the moment of its centenary, um, there are also some non-disciplinary uh, reasons. Uh, and I think uh, uh, there, there are reasons why historians are, are really not wanting to focus too much. Uh, I mean, here, Western historians largely, but it applies to Russia in a slightly different context, not wanting to focus too much on, on the Russian Revolution. The main reason, I think, is surely uh, the fact of the Soviet Union disint uh, Union's disintegration in 1991, the collapse of, of, of the Soviet Union. Now, this isn't, to my mind, strictly logical. In other words, the, the, the importance of the revolution, unless you consider that the only justification of revolution is to, is to produce a nation state that lasts for a long time, uh, <coughs> it's not entirely logical to say that if, if, if that state collapses after, after, uh, after 74 years, uh, that detracts from the uh, status of the founding event. But I think that's how people feel about it, that, that that's a sort of instinctive not wholly rational uh, conclusion. In other words, because of that uh, of that event, even though it's now uh, uh, whatever it is, you know, twenty years uh, twenty years past, nevertheless, I think we're still dealing with it. Uh, as Ronald Suni writes, uh, speaking of a socialist who became a Soviet historian in the 1960s in a new book called Red Flag Unfurled, uh, uh, this is not the world we anticipate. This, this world we're in now. Then, uh, back in the 1960s, the object of our study, the Soviet Union and communist regimes in East Central Europe, were alive, if not well. And few imagined that Lenin's utopian vision, even after its descent into Stalinist nightmare, would collapse so abruptly at a moment of neoliberal triumph. Now, some scholars, like Sunni, felt the collapse of the Soviet Union as a loss. Others, with less of an emotional state, were nevertheless <coughs> disconcerted by not having predicted it. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this applied not only to political scientists, who do at least sometimes uh, imply that they have predictive <coughs> powers, uh, but also to historians who very rarely claim to be able to predict. Uh, one reaction, not often expressed, but I think quite widespread in the field, among historians and others, was to feel slightly guilty about not having, uh, having seen in advance that the Soviet Union was going to collapse, and to wonder if one's past understandings of the revolution and Soviet history had been wrong. Uh, that, in turn, perhaps translates into repeating the current buzzword of failure, uh, that the revolution was, of course, a failure, 
uh, also avoiding discussion of achievements, uh, avoiding what used to be the automatic uh, sort of mention of euphoria attending a, a initial phases of revolution, and downplaying even the revolution's impact on the world and historical uh, significance. Now, I myself had a slightly different reaction to the, um, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, which since I'm, uh, uh, I've gone faster through my text than I expected to, uh, and that was uh, to, uh, to think about the question of historical inevitability. Now, I had always had a great objection to the notion of, of laws of history which uh, enabled, uh, which, which produces economiasmisty uh, or any sense of inevitability, but I hadn't clearly examined that sense. Uh, in particular, I hadn't uh, thought about the question that we seem to assume that if, if we, well, we know sort of from, from our everyday lives that small things are not, that the, deta that the, that the details of life are not uh, occur in an unpredictable and contingent manner, there is some assumption uh, that, the, that the big events, for big events, uh, there uh, is a, some kind of zakonomy uh, And it was my reaction to the collapse of the Soviet Union was uh, that, that this, th this was indeed a non-inevitable uh, uh, event, and uh, I mean, not only it, that it, one could, of course, think, uh, even if one thought quite badly of the Sovietological profession, the fact that virtually nobody had predicted it uh, would would uh, would make you think. But it, anyway, the way what it made me think about uh, was the, uh, the the fact that indeed it is a false logic that says that big attempts, uh, big events, must be in some way uh, predictable. So I start to get interested in chaos theory as uh, as applied to history, because you then uh, if if you if you um, uh, <coughs> that is an, an, that neatly demolishes that sense that the larger the event, the more likely. Uh, to have uh, an inevitability about it. I also start to think, by the way, about the fact, the way that historical explanation uh, leads one to write as if things were inevitable, as if we thought things were inevitable even when we don't. Now, I, I gave a talk in Princeton last week when I, I was saying something about this inevitability question, and somebody said to me, well, but when you wrote the Russian Revolution, you must have thought otherwise because the, uh, I mean, this is now 40 years back that I wrote the Russian Revolution, uh, because there uh, 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 some sort of inevitability is implied. Uh, and I thought about that, and I, in, uh, I, uh, that was not what I wanted. I didn't have that sense that there was an inevitability uh, about the Russian Revolution, but simply the, the fact of explaining tends to imply uh, and, uh, that there is an inevitability in, involved. And I don't know quite what one does about that, actually. I mean, how, as historians, we, we cope with that um, particular narrative problem. Right. Um, so, um, in conclusion, uh, history may not be history may not be cyclical, but if you stay uh, around long enough uh, in uh, writing history, you can't help noticing that there's something cyclical in historians' interest and judgments of significance. Uh, in other words, uh, wait long enough and, uh, and, and uh, a, a way of thinking that you thought had, or an area of study that seemed to have disappeared will come back again in, in new guise. Uh, thus, I would assume that after a while, the Russian Revolution will come back in historical fashion again, with a future generation of historians discovering that it mattered after all if not quite for the reasons their 20th century predecessors had thought. Now, with regard to Russian assessment, I, mean, I think it, one of the odder things is, is, is the Russian refusal, uh, the Russian failure uh, to celebrate uh, the centenary. I, I suspect here that Sergei Lavrov was right in thinking that for Russia, the Russian Revolution is too big to be ignored in the long or even medium term. It may seem difficult at the moment to fit the revolution into a usable national past, uh, but ways will surely be found. It's not so often, after all, that something happens in Russia that, quote, shakes the world, as, as John Reed put it. There really are national reputational st uh, issues at stake here. Like it or not, <coughs> Russia can no more afford to forget the Russian Revolution than France to forget the French Revolution. <coughs> 
and the French were still remembering and arguing about their revolution at its bicentenary. If I were not a prediction skeptic, I would predict that in 2117, Russia will do the same. Thank you. Shall I take questions, or would you prefer to? Yeah, you take. All right. Yanni. Uh, Sheila, thank you very much. Only you could present a lecture like this, which is comprehensive and based on real research and reading. Um, um, and thank you very much. And I'm glad that you, you concluded our series. Uh, I have a, like a, a small question that's significant and a large question that's also significant. Um, and the small one is sort of when we're narrating 1917. Uh, what's gone more and more out of our narratives, right? and you're the one who would have command of this kind of information, is the um, you know questions of sheer poverty, questions of sheer misery, mm -hmm. combined with a sense that it shouldn't be such because after all, you know, if you read Lenin in 1917, Lenin is saying that you know we, we have all the means we need we have we need to take care of problems of poverty, to take care of problems of hopelessness, uh, to give people not only their basics but even more and hope and so on and so forth. And how this fits into you know our nar narratives up until 1917 and even be a little beyond, uh, meaning a sense that there was a, that, that there are real issues that need to be addressed. You know, it wasn't simply about ideas. It wasn't simply about interpretations, and it's not really about historians, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's about how we're looking at our sources and what the sources are telling us. So that'd be the first one, and meaning where where do, does that have a place in our narratives anymore, especially your narrative? Um, and the second one is that, as I was listening to you, and, re and you were so you're enumerating all of the historians who have mounted these sort of, um, you know, take Bob Service, you know, the, a certain kind of criticism of the Russian Revolution, um, and, I, and he did write what he wrote, right? And I understand completely why you criticize him, but there are many people who have written intelligent criticisms too, right? Um, and so I'm thinking of Mark Malia, for example, so who is in many ways, you know, one would disagree with him. I disagree with him in many regards. Um, but his criticism was, was different, and, it, and it's harder to deal with. And his criticism of the Russian Revolution was not that they tried to achieve this and failed, but they tried to achieve this and succeeded, and it was a terrible idea in the first place, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Meaning, that's his criticism. Um, and up to a point, I even agree with him, right? It, depending on how we define the idea in the first place, right? Um, but after a point, I don't agree with him. Uh, and, and, uh, but I also, you know, I think about it, I read it, I take a long view, and, and I still find it difficult to come to terms with that criticism. What do you do with that criticism? Right. I, so let, let me get my thoughts organized on this. The, first of all, actual misery, etc., to, um, to which the revolution was a response, and does it belong in the narrative? I. I think it's certainly, I mean, it's hard to, to me to think how I would write the narrative if, if I did it all over again, but I, I, I feel that this would almost certainly be in. But I feel as if reading uh, the, the recent stuff, uh, that there is a feeling that you bring, given that we've, 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 we've got the revolution and, and Stalinism so sort of, uh, so tightly put together now, uh, that talk, too much talk about uh, misery, economic misery, too much talk about uh, a sense of oppression under Tsarism, that this, is, this comes under the whitewashing character. I think that's what people are avoiding. I think that's what Smith is, you know, what, what's bothering him. And I, I'm sorry to sort of go after him because, you know, I have a high opinion of him as a historian, but he, he, lay, he seems to me to be laying out some of the awkwardnesses rather well. Now, on the question of um, yes, of how do you deal with the Melia argument that it was success, but a success, but a terrible idea, in the first place, uh, I suppose the first thing I would say is that although I've just given a uh, a lecture on the question of is the was the Russian Revolution a failure, I actually think that using failure and success as our analytical framework is not the most um, profitable way of going at it anyway. I mean, it, because it is so likely to introduce all the time sort of uh, uh, sub subjective judge. Well, I mean, our judgments are always subjective, but this, 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 really, uh, this really encourages it. Uh, on the question of terrible idea in the first place, and do I personally agree with that? Of course, uh, my first reaction is I don't personally agree with Melia. Uh, 
<laughs> because that, that's what was often, uh, you know, in practice the case. On this particular proposition, uh, I guess I'd have to say that I do think revolution is a terrible idea, in, in the sense that I think that, uh, I, I, I mean, when I read Medinsky, whom I obviously, I don't like Medinsky either, and he's saying revolution <laughs> always ends badly, and they, they just make things worse, and it brings out all the worst aspects of people. I think I personally think that. That was, I, I, and I, I didn't, it wasn't something that I went into the field exactly thinking. I mean, for example, when I started doing the, the Russian Revolution, I think at first my attitude was, uh, I was interested in the pathos of the inevitable failure of revolution to produce the things that its participants hope it will produce. That was my first, I think, mm -hmm. reaction. But then as I got into it a bit more, uh, I really got the sense that, uh, <coughs> that you know, okay, I idealism is around, and if you take, uh, you know, if you do a text-based based study, that's going to be terribly important. But, but I, I also think that the people who get drawn to revolution are often the people. I mean, they're the young young men who want to go and knock heads. That, in other words, the violence, the violence and, and long-term violence is not a surprising outcome of revolution, but rather an, a, 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 an almost automatic one in that that's, uh, you know, people are to a de degree join, uh, drawn in because of, of ideals and ideas, uh, but to a large extent they're also drawn in because, uh, uh, because, because they like beating people up and they like to beat up the people they don't like. Uh, so in that sense, that, that and my sort of evolving sense of revolution, um, I suppose, um, uh, yeah, that was, mm. that was my, so it puts me not so far away from many as one might expect. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Jane and um, uh, thanks, thanks again for a wonderful lecture, and uh, I want to ask about um, one of the problems of thinking about the Russian Revolution, I think, is because we define it as Russian. Russian. And, that, and uh, the French like to think about their revolution as French as well. But both these revolutions took place in the context of great imperial rivalry in uh, a time of uh, attempted change in world history on the part of many actors. And so, um, What's puzzling me now is um, why we um, have continued to search for causes or explanatory structures uh, and, and, and look at outcomes, um, primarily from a domestic history point mm -hmm. of view. Mm -hmm. Now, this has been a problem in our field, that, that foreign, foreign affairs, foreign history, and domestic history were quite separated. And I think a positive thing about the historiography, the new historiography on World War I, is that it really has started to shift the um, frame, widen the frame of looking at the, at the so-called Russian Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, but I, this is more a comment than a specific question, but do you see um, a way, uh, do you see in some recent works uh, a real reflection in uh, of the new imperial, trans-imperial, transnational uh, kinds of uh, questions that many scholars are working on, and whether you see that this might be a productive way to to reframe the way we think about the revolution and its both its causes and and its and its, and its consequences. No, I, absolutely, I do. I, I do think of it. Uh, I, 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 I mean, but here I'm at a disadvantage of having not yet read Laura's book, so mm. I can't uh, react to her, her frame of it. And a lot of that work, I mean, there's a whole lot of work going on within that rubric of 14 to 21. Yes. And it's, it's work in progress, and it's not work in progress it's where I personally yeah. am working. So I'm kind of waiting for it to come out to. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 to, uh, to make its impact, but I assume, yes, that, that, that that's got to be, of course, I mean, there, there is something quite sort of absurd about treating it just within, within that, not, not only, of course, not even, it's it, it just Russia, you mm -hmm. know, it, uh, of course it is. Now, it's, 
maybe I went to the wrong conferences. <laughs> <laughs> but um, some of them dealt with global impact, but not in the way you were describing. Global impact means um, how did the left in Venezuela react to the revolution? Yeah. How did, you know, and, and, and which is all uh, actually quite, I mean, it's, it's interesting to get this uh, accumulation. Of, of information, but of course one, one knew that the left all over the country, all over the world, reacted to the Russian Revolution, and that's, that's not quite the shift in perspective that I think you're suggesting. Yeah. Yes, sir. Michael Petrovsky. Thank you, Mr. Tucker, that you invited me here, and thank you, Mrs. Fitzpatrick. I arrived from Russia several months ago here, and I have one question to you because uh, I participated in two events in modern Russia. This is uh, Eurasian Economic Union Treaty signed in 2018. I was involved. And in the events in 1991, I was involved inside when USSR dissolved. And my par grandparents participated in February 17. Grandfather was Max Goldfarb, a leader of the band. And uh, in October, November events. And does it make sense to distinguish revolution and cope? And what? And cope. 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 Excuse me for my English pronunciation. <laughs> to understand the moving forces, results, and forecasting of the events. Thank you. You're talking about the, the, cool. the, the cool. interpretation cool. of cool. October. Like, I'm not practicing cool. a lot of the yeah. speech. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'm, I myself not pit in I'm historian not. science. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, <coughs> the Bolshevik. Uh, I mean, the argument about the, the Bolshevik uh, assumption of power in October was uh, uh, always cast in terms of: Is this a popular revolution? Uh, in the West, anyway, this is a discussion from the 1960s. This is a popular re revolution or a coup, and I actually am not very interested in that argument because uh, it seems to me that they're clearly, uh, they're, there's clearly there's there's a popular force involved. At the same time, the way in which power uh, is transferred, if you call it a real transfer of power in October, uh, that was not through popular uh, through a popular uprising, and so you can <coughs> use the word uh, uh, coup if you want to. So I'm I'm not. That's, that's not a question that, um, that, that, that I, I mean, I feel both sides, uh, both sides uh, had a point, and in that argument, I think they both, uh, that, that, that people tended to take the position that fitted their general uh, approach to the revolution, uh, in other words, a quite politicized dis uh, discussion, and uh, yeah, I would say it probably remains so. Uh, I noticed that, um, I know not, uh, Peter Varot, would that be, uh, that, Putin suggested maybe we should call it Pietrovarod instead mm. of Rivovutsi, which I take to be a sort of reference mm. to uh, to coup. Uh, but didn't uh, that that he floated that in 2015 and then it it sort of dropped. It doesn't seem to have become the terminology mm. this year in Russia. Thank you. As a non-historian looking at the question of the success of the revolution, I would think of it in four ways. One in terms of the international question of spreading the communist ideology and what influence the fact that it, the way things happened in Russia influenced that. And in Russia itself, I would look at it in terms of have you improved the quality of the lives of the people over time compared to what might have happened if the Russian Revolution had failed at its inception? One would think that with all of the terror that it existed during the period and the current living standards that it was probably a failure. Another way of looking at it would be in terms of the success of what it has in promoting Russia as a global power, where I think it's still somewhat of an open question. Uh, and then the third is the interesting question which hasn't been addressed, is if it looks at forgetting the ideology and the propaganda that was used of a shift of the ruling class, have those who aspire to the new elite been a success? And they are considering even the failure of the revolution, the fact that these guys became the oligarchs and quite wealthy and powerful raises the question of might it have not have been a success for that group? 
I, yes, well, certainly um, if we go back pre-oligarchs and look in within a Soviet context, uh, there certainly was, uh, uh, I mean, there was a, a, a process. There was a conscious for, uh, process on the Bolshevik part of forming a new elite, and that new elite they were trying to form uh, uh, in part by affirmative action from lower classes. And I would say that that that, uh, that there was a, su a substantial amount uh, of well success. If uh, but then here you get in the problem of success. Do, does one does one sympathise with the with the objective? But in any case, and. So a new elite of, of quite substantially working class and peasant origins was formed, and that is the sort of Brezhnev uh, generation. And I think it's not, if one if one's thinking about Soviet history over the the long haul, it's certainly not. Um, uh, it's not irrelevant that those people felt they owed their their success, their own personal success in life, to the revolution, which had enabled people like them to rise. I think that's quite important. Now, the, the oligarchs, of course, uh, come on the scene after, uh, and it's a different set of circumstances that uh, enable them to rise. Now, the question of, I, 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 I think, yes, when, the, the, the first question you, you posed about um, I, if the revolution hadn't occurred, would, it, would things have been better, basically, would, uh, 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 for, 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 the, for the people? The, the, the problem is uh, that that we don't know what would have happened if the particular revolution that happened hadn't happened. In other words, we, we can't really, that Russia was not in, an, in a sort of stable condition where suddenly something pushed it off the rails. It was in a tremendous mess as of October uh, uh, 1917. So if not the Bolsheviks, something else. Somebody else is going to try and stabilize it. Uh, and it's uh, and maybe not one, but a series of attempts at stabilization will be made. And so it makes it terribly difficult to work out, uh, you know, if, if, to work out whether the, the actual historical outcome was better than other possible outcomes. There's, of course, a different kind of calculation that you can make that people would often make, say, uh, uh, in retrospect, which is, uh, was the situation in, let's say, 1928 better than that of 1913? Etc. You can do that, but then that, of course, elides the question that you've got a whole war and um, uh, withdrawal from war and, and sort of political crisis collapse uh, that comes after that, 1913. So I will use my, my prerogative to ask the next question, which is that you commented that uh, in, in your responses just now that success and failure is not ultimately the most satisfactory frame in which to examine the revolution. And I have two questions about that. The first is, the first relates to a piece of writing that you published in the London Review, uh, which was a review, perhaps, of China Miaville's book, or it was, it was perhaps- It was a bunch of them. It was yeah. a bunch of them, and it was, and it was what's left, and it was the, that the answer that some had come to was, in fact, China, because the search for a, an assessment of success and failure in revolution is a search for our own present Day. And the French Revolution continues to be debated and existed because we think of its project as going forward. And that was thrown into question with the project of the Russian Revolution, with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. But perhaps we can find an alternate pathway to drawing its significance into our unfolding future through the Chinese planned economy, was, was how I interpreted your reading of that line of thinking. And the second is, uh, would you then comment on alternative frameworks for thinking about it today, rather than success or failure? Ah, oh, right. Yeah, I'm not sure about the Chinese Revolution or the or, the, or China as the most important outcome. Uh, I di I didn't exactly read read it like that. I thought that that was uh, actually Brenton trying to think of the most insulting thing he could say. I see. <laughs> <laughs> I, in other words, it's it's. Uh, but you. Yeah, you could say if 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 we're looking strictly in the question of relevance to us at this moment, uh, perhaps that makes sense. But I, you know, will it make sense in twenty years or or forty years? I I I, I don't know. And uh, so I I'd be I myself would not be sort of interested yeah. in 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 embracing that line. Now 
it's also probably true, I mean, uh, that, you know, I, I cited those various people like Kolonitsky saying they're not, uh, that it, they're not as interested in, uh, in the revolution as they used to be. Well, I never was that interested in the revolution, but I probably less than I used to be. So, in other words, I wouldn't, I, for me, um, there's not a, a, a really interesting thing I want to know, mm -hmm. I personally want to know. Uh, involved uh, with the revolution. Now, in, in terms of the uh, of of uh, the alternative frameworks to the success or failure, uh, and it's it's actually terribly difficult. It's been, here again, you get into a writing problem. If I think about about my Russian Revolution, I mean, I have revolution achieved and revolution betrayed. As I, I mean, I have as it were two columns, and that's as essentially a sort of success and, and uh, failure thing, and I certainly couldn't think of another way to sum it up. Now, um, some people have suggested we talk about legacy. Well, you couldn't, I mean, mm -hmm. but that's, which is just a way of, of avoiding the, uh, the value judgment. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have, but because I myself, you know, I'm not, there's not an unsolved question in there that, uh, I mean, there are masses of unsolved questions, but the Russian Revolution isn't leading me to any of the ones that personally matter to me. Therefore, it's hard for me to say how I would <coughs> approach its study. So, Josh. <coughs> Thank you so much again for such a stimulating lecture. I have two questions. The first, so we're actually live streaming, and we have people at other universities who've arranged to watch the live stream and who get an opportunity to ask questions. So this is a question from Luke Walters at Baylor University who's writing it and saying, have you ever reconsidered ending the revolution in the 1930s with the purges? If so, why and what other alternatives did you consider? Well, before I did end, end it with the purges, that was when I considered alternatives. Uh, have you reconsidered it since, like, in light of the time? Yeah, well, let me say something the, about the considerations yeah. that, uh, uh, that, that I thought of at the time, because, uh, I mean, it's, it's not... At this moment, I'm not thinking of writing a new book on the Russian Revolution, so it's no, it's it's, it's not an it's not a, a, an actual question for me at the moment. But back then, I I did I did think uh, how to how to end it, and to me, and and the, my choice of including the Great Purges uh, was I have to say an unpopular one with the people who otherwise liked my work. It was quite popular with the people who didn't. But um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because basically the, the, the social historians felt that uh, felt that introducing the purges was implying that there's a continuity between the revolution and Stalinism, uh, or at any rate uh, between the revolution and the great purges. And uh, as a revisionist, that uh, I. I Probably, I, it was felt I shouldn't think in terms of continuity, but I actually did, in a way. Uh, in other words, it, see, <coughs> I, it, it both seemed to me that uh, with Stalin's, uh, you know, sort of great leap forward of the first five-year plan, that he was, he was, not only did he think he was doing part two to Lenin's political revolution, as far as I could see, he more or less was. I accepted that. Now, you could end there, like Carr did, and say, you know, okay, part one was uh, political revolution, part two was economic revolution, and uh, by uh, as of the early 1930s, you could say they have uh, they carried that out. Uh, but I pr I probably was not so inclined to end on end on a sort of triumphal as not that may have been a part of it. But I also. Perhaps partly because I, 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 the French Revolutionary analogy was quite important to me as to the Bolsheviks. I couldn't help feeling that having a, a, a purge that has no, uh, uh, whose purpose is extremely unclear, uh, that seems, uh, uh, but involves random violence against people who are regarded as enemies, that got a revolutionary feel to me. Uh, therefore, I, 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 I saw it as, uh, uh, and not only did I see the French Revolutionary parallel, which I think Stalin also thought saw, and uh, was a part of his thinking. Uh, but I thought that was one way of making sense of it. And now, the other way of making sense of the Great Purges at that time was to say, well, totalitarian regimes public, uh, practice periodic mass purging. Uh, and the problem with that argument is that uh, in the Soviet Union, basically, it was practiced just once. 
So uh, I, 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 on, on anything like that scale. So I didn't buy that, uh, that, that sense of it. I, I felt the purges made more sense seen as a sort of postscript of revolutionary violence. Is there another one, Josh, or not? Sure, I'll ask my question then. <laughs> so my question, I was intrigued when you started off the talk and said you know, that one way to think about success and failure was this, does success bring a new country? And then by that, it's a very clear definition that you get success in 1917 and you get failure in 1991. But I want to push you a little bit as someone who's a political scientist but who's written on legacies in, from a political science perspective on to what extent you think what happens under in Russia today Putin's Russia today, the sort of ultimate outcome of, of what that regime is that we don't know yet. Is that something that will ultimately weigh on what we think about the success or failure of 1917 from the vantage point you've discussed it today? Or do we close the book on 1917 with the end of the Soviet Union and we are able to say, look, if we're going to talk about success or failure, let's talk about the success <laughs> or failure of what it wrought directly. Mm -hmm. And we're going to say this is a new period, it's a new country, it's a new a lot of things. And what happens in this is going to be the success or failure of what's done here. Or at the very least, it may have legacies from communism, but they're intermingled with enough new things that it's time to stop talking about the success or failure of 1917 based on what happens in Putin's Russia in the 2020s, for example. Mm -hmm. No, that's a, an interesting question of whether one can, uh, one closes the book uh, in 1991. For this uh, purpose of, as, of assessment of the success or failure. Of right. The well, I, I mean, my, my provisional response to that would be, as of now, I think one probably does. Now that, ex uh, however, I mean, who knows what happens in the future. If, if in Russia you have a sort of swerve back, uh, a re-embrace of, I don't know what aspects of, 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 of the Soviet Union, but <coughs> in any case, something, uh, th this is not the way it looks going to me at the moment, but, uh, you know, as I said, one doesn't know what happened. So then I can imagine that, that, that then you change your approach and you say, okay, 1991 is too early, a cutoff point, and let's carry it on to whenever. Yes, yes. I've read that most revolutions occur not at the nadir of a country's fortunes, but when things are improving, but not improving fast enough. And to add to that, I've read that between 19 and 1914, Russia was expanding railroads, factories, communications at a rate not rivaled at any time since. And if the economic progress of today cost 30 million lives in the 30s, and it's dependent now today mainly on oil, minerals, which are hard to extract and transport, then has the revolution actually succeeded? Do many Russians live, as many of us might do, the lives of quiet desperation? Uh, yes, well, uh, on the question of uh, the, the Tocquevillian interpretation of, uh, uh, of, of revolution occurring when things are getting better rather than when but they're at their names. Well, I think that that, that, that that makes sense. I mean, that seems to be empirically uh, the case, and it also makes sense, doesn't it? Because improvement, uh, as soon as things start to improve, you kind of hope they improve more, and the dissatisfaction of those, and, 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 and you have disruptions of familiar patterns and so on. Uh, so I, I would uh, more or less uh, accept, uh, accept that notion, and indeed one might add a sort of um, rider to it, uh, which has to do with that the Bolsheviks used to talk, and in and, and, and Marxism, the proletariat is conceived as, as the lowest. But of course, the industrial working class was anything but the lowest class in Russia. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's uh, underneath it are, 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 are many uh, less, less privileged, so that, so that one, that also introduces a, a change into the notion of exactly what is going on. Uh, now, the question of, um, was the last part of your question more or less uh, about? It was that the Russian economy, Russia proper, apart from the empire, was doing very well economically between 1900 and 1914, and most rates of increase have not been matched since. We're told now that 
after several years of negative growth, Russia might be inching towards growth. This hardly suggests a successful revolution and a successful set of new structures. Mm -hmm. So I would I would feel there's a heavy weight of failure here. Uh -huh. partially in response to the previous, I'm not sure it will be a question, but oh, it will be a question, yeah. Um, uh, maybe two points. Because there is a Russian saying or joke or proverb which can be reinterpreted to mean something for today's talk. It, it's roughly, you can say something like this. A revolution cannot be called a failure. If it is a failure, it's usually called a riot. Say that again? <laughs> oh, uh, a, a revolution cannot be called a failure. If it is a failure, it's usually called a riot. <laughs> which basically means if revolution succeeds in, displace, in displacing the old regime mm -hmm. and jumping into something from which there's no return back, then, I mean, it's, it succeeds succeed by default or by definition. And what, what happens next is the next question. And because expectations are never met, whatever people want from it, kind of a, they will be fucked. Some of it is some disappointed, some not. And then, but, but that's kind of a... Uh, uh, and then indeed we come to your point that the whole discourse about failure and success, which is kind of going on now, seems to be less about kind of a revolution per se, but more about intentionality of the current office, their vulnerable emotions, complexes, uh, and uh, um, uh, and in this sense, indeed, kind of maybe we could try to replace it with something else. You suggested legacy of maybe if we start talking about effects, if effects. Uh, mm -hmm. Then will be a much more kind of the emotions could be cooled down, and we can kind of start seeing something which is um, uh, which matters today. Uh, let's say I'll, I'll try to run by you a couple examples. Uh, when the U.S. Congress is trying to repeal Obamacare, they're trying to repeal to repeal the legacy of the Russian Revolution, no matter how watered down, because the idea of public health come to us from the Bolsheviks in 1920 with the universal health care that kind of since then spread around. Uh, when um, Women are fighting for their rights for abortions. They depend on the legacy of the Russian Revolution nowadays because once again, kind of fact, abortions rights come to us from 1920 from the, from the Russian Revolution. It doesn't matter whether these women know it or not, kind of, but, but that's what actually kind of what makes them, kind of, uh, what, what makes it the facts kind of working now. Or when uh, the conservative British government abolishes free higher education and into the situation, and the German conservative government tried to do it, but failed because it had to retreat and kind of under other influence. Then again, kind of, they're fighting over the legacy of the Russian Revolution, because that's kind of a and, and in this sense, it's not labeled as such in the you know, but it's very much present. Right, well, I think that's, uh, no, I, I, that makes a lot of sense to me, but it is exactly the kind of thing that people were not saying uh, in, 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 in the discussions uh, during this centenary year. Uh, I, and I, I think because the whole, uh, the whole sort of, uh, the trend of things was, uh, was to wish to find negative outcome, a, a, a wish to portray it negatively rather than to see, uh, see long-term outcomes because of the fear that seeing long-term outcomes where, where you say, okay, like Obamacare, well, that, that, that goes back to the Soviet uh, public health care, yeah, that, that that will be uh, taken to be a positive evaluation, and one wants to avoid po positive evaluation. <coughs> of course, it's also true. I, I mean, just to, to, to sort of split hairs on some of the, if uh, on some of the things like the, the uh, like uh, public health system and so on, you could also say, well, you know, let's look at Vienna, uh, you know, a, a decade earlier, yeah. and, uh, a, a, and 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 uh, in other words, that I mean, no innovation is ever totally innovative, mm -hmm. and that includes the. Uh, Russian uh, 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 principles of universal health care, uh, which of course were not implemented for a long time. If there is nothing else, I would like to thank Professor Fitzpatrick for a wonderful conclusion to our session.